Please welcome to the stage, ladies and gentlemen, James Herman. Hi. Um, if I can start just by saying a massive thank you to Sadiq and Genevieve and the other people that have brought me such a long way today to be here. And, um, you know, you've no idea after spending a few weeks in China just how nice it is to be in a country with Facebook and road rules. Um, and beyond that, you know, as an advertising person, it's like it's a real pleasure to be set among a group of speakers from walks of life that are as interesting and as meaningful as, as the speakers that are here today. So it's really awesome to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, what I usually talk about, these sorts of things, is how much more effective a more creative approach can be in business. And we're now fortunate to be able to prove numerically and beyond any doubt that more creative marketing is more effective from a commercial standpoint. But once you buy that, right, once you understand that, and once you, once you believe that, another question very quickly becomes central. How then do we become more creative? How then do we become more creative? And it's a question that I think ad agencies and other creative organisations have, have kind of long wrestled with. How do we end up more consistently producing the kind of creative work, the creative uh, output that, make, you know, that makes us proud, that makes a difference, and that moves things forward? And I think that we all get that we, we need to hire great creative people, and we need open plan and soft furnishings and indoor table-based sports and things like that. <laughs> Right, we all know that, and we all do that with great gusto. And as a result, we've no shortage of great ideas. The difficulty is how we get those ideas out into the world without them dying or being compromised along the way. We tend to all be, I think, frustrated at how uncommon it is to realise great ideas and how much more common it is to start with world-changing thinking and end up making something that we'd rather forget. Um, I, just a few weeks ago, I left my job as head of planning at Colenso in Auckland um, to head over to Shanghai to spend some time over there with Ogilvy. And in making that transition, I found myself spending a lot of time kind of, you know, thinking about what made Colenso such a prolifically creative organisation and what, you know, I might learn from my time there. That's Colenso, by the way. Um, you know, and between 2009 and 2011 at Colenso, um, the agency won 21 Lions and 39 Effies with that relatively small group of, of 75 people. Um, you know, for me, like for the first time in my career, I was somewhere where the norm was brilliant ideas making it out of the agency every week. And, you know, thinking getting compromised, compromised outcomes were actually the exception uh, rather than the rule. And I had the you know, really good fortune of being in the middle of this amazingly reliable creative machine that somehow just kept churning out brilliant creative work. And during that time, of course, we had amazing creative people, some great clients, and a kind of creative ambition that, that pervaded the whole agency. But you know, I'd had that at other agencies that I worked at as well. And in fact, I'd worked with Nick Worthington, our, our ECD at Colenso, at another agency in the past. And, you know, despite were those unquestionable brilliance, that agency hadn't been nearly as consistent in terms of being able to get those brilliant ideas um, out into the world. And I think that's something that, you know, most of us have noticed. It isn't just about having great creative people, you know, there's, there's like something else that matters as well. And so at Colenso, you know, there were and there are brilliant creative people, but there was something else as well through that time. And I often find myself wondering whether it was this thing that's the real reason why Colenso managed to so consistently produce such great work. Um, some of you know Brent Smart, probably. Um, he's an Aussie, uh, he's an ad guy, he was the managing director who led Colenso into that period of such success. Um, and any of you that know Smarty will know he's a really brilliant leader for all kinds, of, um, you know, all kinds of reasons. But one thing that for me really stood out about him was how he had this habit that I'd never really seen in anybody that I'd worked with um, before. Smarty had this really cool habit of talking everybody up behind their backs. He would constantly remind me 
how brilliant the people were that we worked with. You know, he'd say to me, what's genius about Steve Cochran is like he's the creative that can come in on the hardest briefs when no one can crack them and it's a big fucking mess and Cochran will just calmly walk in and do a DNAD winning campaign. He would say, you know, what's amazing about Kyle Melnick is he's the only finance director in the industry that cares as much about the creative works as the creative department. He'd say, what's the, you know, the genius of Paul Courtney, who was our head of production, the genius of PC was that he never said no. He could figure out how to do anything, and really you could, like, tell PC you needed to build a time machine, and PC would just ask for a couple of days to figure it out. <laughs> and Smarty would talk the clients up behind their backs as well, you know. He'd say the genius of Herbie, our Vodafone client, was how he could manage, you know, he could manage anything upwards and wrap the bullies from the sales team at Vodafone around his little finger to get great work through. And, you know, these weren't empty, generic kind of compliments. He didn't just say, oh, that person, you know, they're such a nice guy or whatever. He shone a light on specifically what was brilliant about each of us. Now, don't get me wrong, right? We were all flawed, and you could pick us all to pieces if you wanted to, but Smarty chose to do the opposite. And this had a really fascinating effect, right? The, the effect was that everybody's belief in the people that they worked with grew. And collectively, our confidence in what we were capable of together became enormous. And, you know, this wasn't about arrogance. We weren't all running around kind of, you know, thinking we were the hottest, you know, shit in town. It was really like a constructive confidence that enabled us to take greater risks together and believe that we really could pull off amazing creative feats if we really tried. And, you know, we talk about advertising being a confidence game, and I think what we mean by that is that for like a great creative idea to make it out into the world, tons of people have got to have confidence, not just in the idea, but in the people that are going to you know, have to pull that idea off in order to sign the thing off. I think like when you think about artistic creativity, right? artistic creativity tends to thrive on, on alienation, on depression, on low self-esteem. But commercial creativity, the creativity that most of us are engaged with, right? Commercial creativity is actually the opposite. It thrives on confidence and belief in one another. And I'm really interested in this idea that just like we each have self-esteem as individuals, that groups of people have a kind of group esteem equivalent. And what I mean by this, right, is you know you see groups of people that have low group esteem. They have doubts about each other, they don't really gel, they move forward tentatively, if at all. And their ability to stomach the uncertainty of creativity is very, very low. Then there are normal groups that kind of get stuff done and have enough belief in each other to do average things. And then there are those groups of people who consistently achieve great things. And like a great band or a great sports team or whatever, they all have absolute faith in each other. They delight in each other's brilliance. They have high group esteem. And it isn't simply that those groups are just filled with the, like, the best, most talented individuals. Sometimes they are. But I had this great, um, I had this brilliant story once. Um, my wife is a scientist. And, um, oh, that's not her, by the way. Um, <laughs> and uh, my wife's a scientist, and, and that's a, an American evolutionary biologist by the name of David Sloan Wilson. Um, and we were having dinner with David one night. And David studies how groups evolve by working together. And as you can see, and as you'd probably expect of one of the world's preeminent evolutionary biologists, David is a massive nerd. And that night he told us about his favorite experiment. And this is what he told us. An animal breeder colleague of his had tried to evolve hens for productivity in two different ways. Both involved housing hens in groups in cages which is standard practice in the poultry industry. The first method involves selecting the most productive hen within each cage to breed the next generation of hens. The second method involves selecting the most productive cages and using all the hens from those cages to breed the next generation of hens. So what do you think happened? The second method, where they selected the most productive cages full of hens, that method caused egg productivity to increase 160% in six generations, which apparently is an astonishing result as far as artificial selection experiments go. But the first method, where they'd bred with the superstar individual hens, 
caused egg productivity to perversely decline, even though the most productive hens were chosen every generation. After six generations, the farmer had produced a nation of psychopaths who pecked and murdered each other in their incessant attacks. <laughs> that method favoured the nastiest hens who achieved their productivity by suppressing the productivity of other hens. And so David told us, I can tell you with confidence that the eggs in your refrigerator are brought to you by good hands. <laughs> and what the experiment showed, right, his experiment showed that groups of chickens with high group esteem are more productive than those with low group esteem, despite the talent of the individuals. Now back in the human world, you know, we might not literally peck each other to death, but we often figuratively do just that. We kind of create low group esteem by running around pointing out each other's flaws. And it's such a common thing, isn't it, to feel frustrated by the shortcomings of others and to ease our frustrations by sharing them with someone who might understand. But doing this cultivates doubt. It erodes the confidence we may have been able to find in one another. Group esteem is fragile and it's really easy to snuff out. But I think it's equally quick and easy to build high group esteem just by doing you know, what Smarty does. That simple habit of bothering to observe the particular brilliance of those around us, then sharing that observation behind those people's backs. It really is such a simple act, but the, it has this kind of profound butterfly effect. Let's say you do this once, right, about one person. You figure out what's brilliant about them, and you mention that to somebody behind their back, right? Simply by thinking about and deciding what's brilliant about that person inevitably gives you a confidence boost in them. Then the people you make the observation to get a lift in confidence toward that person and they tend to onshare your observation to others. And finally, the person who's been talked up notices others' confidence in them lifting, creating in turn a lift in their own self-confidence and engendering goodwill back in the opposite direction. And so the virtuous cycle begins. And that's just the result of one of these acts. Habitually doing this, as I saw at Colenso, creates groups of people with incredible confidence in each other who then exploit that confidence to do brilliantly creative things. Okay, so this is my idea for today, right? I think that we all too readily find each other's flaws. And I think we all too eagerly share those flaws behind each other's backs. And I think we pass this behaviour off as a kind of benign bitchiness, right? It's not particularly attractive, but it's not that harmful either. Really though, I think we need to start seeing this for the profoundly harmful thing that it is. Something which in fact sabotages our chances of achieving brilliant creativity by cultivating doubt and low group esteem. And I think it should infuriate us when people behave in this way. Every bit as much as bad briefs and link tests and politics and all the other things which stifle creativity. And you know, even when we're not running around being critical of each other, we rarely talk each other up. When it comes to proving our value, we, we're very much left to our own devices. I believe we can be better than this. And that the reward for being so will be that our best creative ideas more consistently see the light of day. All I think we need to do is make a habit of talking each other up behind each other's backs. That we should each go back to work after a ward. That we should figure out what makes someone else on our team so brilliant. And that we should then tell everyone that behind their backs. And that we should keep doing it. I think we should all cultivate Smarty's peculiar habit. And that we should see what difference that makes to the quality of creativity at next year's award. Thank you very much. Thank you.